Good morning, church. We have three scripture readings this morning, and the first one is found in 1 Chronicles 16, 11, and it says this. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. Our second scripture is Psalms 40, 1 through 3. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. And he had put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it in fear and shall trust in the Lord. And our final is found in Acts 1.14. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. May the Lord richly bless you as we read his word. Thank you. Last Sabbath, we were looking at some of the principles of prayer, and if you were <clears throat> with us last week, you realized we talked about God wants us to pray to Him in faith, we are to pray with humility, we are to pray in harmony with His will, pray with thanksgiving, and pray in the name or spirit of Jesus Christ. And there is a sixth principle that we're going to spend the entire sermon on today. It's pretty critical, and you can understand how critical it is by the amount of energy, time, space, and examples you find on this principle in God's Word. You and I need to pray with persistence. Satan wants us to give up, and when we do, he smiles, and God doesn't. So we're going to spend some time looking at this principle of praying with persistence, and we're going to do it by looking at some of the teachings in Scripture that tells us that this is an important element in our prayer life with God, and then we'll look at a couple examples uh, to reinforce the idea. So let's first think about the teachings on the principle of persistence. If you want to be with me, we're back in Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11, Jesus tells us the parable of the persistent friend. Now, in parables, settings are important. And so the parable of the persistent friend is told by Jesus in connection with the answer he provides to his disciples when they ask him to teach them how to pray. So we're in Luke 11, verse 1. And it came to pass, as Jesus was praying in a certain place, when he stopped, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John the Baptist also taught his disciples. The reason this question is posed to Jesus is the disciples are impressed with his ability to pray. They had been listening to his conversation with his heavenly father, and they were impressed with the degree of intimacy Jesus communicated with his father. You see, these prayers that Jesus was offering were significantly different than what the disciples had heard other Jewish leaders pray in the synagogue. They wanted to have what Jesus had. So they said, teach us how to do that. Jesus tells the parable after answering their question. The answer is in verses 2 through 4. So he told them, when you pray, say. This is a familiar passage, but it's the example that Jesus offers. It's not something you and I are supposed to recite. It's the model that Jesus gives so that all his disciples know 
how to pray in a way that pleases God. So let's look at verses 2 through 4. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. These are some of the principles we went over last week. Give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. And we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This is the answer that Jesus gave. These verses show that Jesus wants us to understand the principles that govern our communications with our Heavenly Father. And one of the principles that we didn't touch on last week, and I'll just say it briefly, the sequencing is important. We are to seek first the things of God then ask for our daily needs. Again, don't raise your hand. How much time do we spend in our prayer life asking God to accomplish the things that God wants done? Compared with, okay, this is what I want. So, the parable of the persistent prayer follows these principles that we looked at last week. The parable is pretty easy to understand. It's in verses 5 through 8. Jesus said to them, Which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. For a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I have nothing to offer him to eat. You've got to remember, in that culture, hospitality is absolutely critical. Okay? You better open the door when somebody comes. And you better provide them something to eat when they come. There was no Motel 6 in their day. Uh, for, okay, uh, verse 7. He will answer from within, the person who was asked the question, Do not trouble me. The door is now shut and my children are in bed with me. I cannot rise and give you the bread. Verse 8, Jesus says, I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because, of, because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence he will rise and give him as many as he needs. The guy who's in bed with his kids asleep behind the closed door will arise and share what bread he has if his friend keeps asking. Every kid knows this principle. And every parent wishes they didn't. Jesus gives us the moral of the story. Verses 9 and 10. And I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And he who seeks finds. And he who knocks, it will be opened. Remember when these documents were initially written, the numbers weren't there. Dr. Luke writes this in a continuous thought process. Verses 8 and 9 follow verses 5 and 8 because that thought is the logical consequence to the material presented before it. In contrast to the sleepy friend, God graciously gives what we need when we ask persistently. Also notice that in the model prayer, it doesn't say, give me what I need for next summer. It doesn't even say, give me what I need for Thanksgiving. Give me what I need today. Presupposes you're going to ask the same thing tomorrow. Persistence in our prayers is one of those principles that sometimes we forget. Satan gets us into thinking that if God really loves me and he knows everything, why doesn't he just give what I want? Because he's a parent, and like all of us, he likes it when his kids call him. Joel's sleeping, 
so I can use this illustration. He came in at like 6 this morning. When he's in the academy, both he and his sister, we had to pay for the phones. If you ever send a kid to academy, you know why, because they don't have any money anyway. We said you can have a phone on the condition that you check in with mom and dad every day. And they learned that lesson because they liked having a phone. Amen. They're no longer in academy, but that behavior sticks. Amen. And more than once, Karen and I have looked at each other and say, have you heard from Joel? No. I wonder what's wrong. <laughs> Parents love to hear from their kids even if all they want is more money. We like to hear from our kids. All the kids are talking to their parents right now. God's no different. Yes, he knows what you want, but he likes it when you ask. That's why the model prayer says, give us this day our daily bread. So we have to say it again tomorrow and the next day. Persistence in our prayer is connected strongly with learning how to pray the way Jesus wants God's children to pray. You can't separate the two. It is clearly established in Scripture. Let's move on to the parable of the persistent widow. Luke chapter 18. This time, Jesus gives us the moral of the story up front. He's flexible. Luke chapter 18, verse 1. Then Jesus spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. Jesus expects his disciples then and now... To engage in persistent prayer while we wait for his second coming. And not lose heart. There are parents who have prayed for their children for decades. Before God said, okay. Just think if mom and dad quit after 15 years. I know I'm not as persistent and consistent as I need to be. And I wonder what God would have done if I kept asking. The parable illustrates the benefit and value of being consistent. Verses 2 through 5. There was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. He could care less. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, Avenge me of my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterwards he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because the widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she wearies me. It's amazing how kids only read certain parts of the Bible. No, never mind. I won't go there. Never mind. Jesus adds, God will be mindful of those who cry out to him. Verses 6 through 8. Then the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long for them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Interesting. Jesus wants us to pray with persistence. And if you remember from last Sabbath, one of the principles of effective prayer was to be praying in faith. Now look at verse 8. Second half. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, he, will he really find faith on the earth? I wonder if he's talking about the faith necessary to be consistent and persistent in our prayers. 
Will Jesus find a group of people persistently praying when he comes back? Will they still have the faith to ask again for what they have asked for before and have yet received? Will he find people like that? You and I need to understand that praying in faith was the first principle of effective prayer. This is the kind of faith I think Jesus is looking for when he comes the second time. Because without that faith, we'll stop and give up. Why bother? He's not listening anyway, or so we say. Persistence is related to our ability to demonstrate our faith in God. That's why you pray for the third decade. Okay, we'll go past the parables. Maybe we'll look at a few of the teachings of Paul. Turn to Romans chapter 12. Paul gives a summary of how God wants his children to behave in Romans chapter 12. This is probably about six sermons in itself, but we won't take that much time. I want you to be in Romans chapter 12. We'll look at verses 9 through 13. In my Bible, this paragraph is entitled, Behave Like a Christian. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor, giving preference to one another. Okay. I live in Winder. It takes an hour and 30 minutes to get to the airport. It takes a little less when you leave at, you know, 5 o'clock in the morning. But as I was spending an hour and a half going and an hour and a half coming back, I looked at a lot of behaviors of cars who weren't concerned that other people may be more important than them. I'm not making this up. I'm in the slowest lane I can be. And I'm going just 10 miles over the speed limit. And it's like I'm parked. Okay, I'm done. Where am I? I lost my plane. <laughs> How did I get on that thought? Uh, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor, giving preference to one another. Yeah, I didn't see that this morning. Not la- lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continually, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saint, given to hospitality. Those are the kinds of behaviors Christians are supposed to be engaged in when you're not on the interstate. Or it was heathen morning, one or the other. But look at verse 12. By constant communion with God through prayer, we can maintain strength and courage to endure on the interstate. If we aren't consistent in our prayer, we are not acting like the children of God that we say we are. Because the Holy Spirit had Paul tell us what my behavior should look like. Verse 12 says I'm supposed to be in constant communion with God. Only by being what God asks us to be in the strength that he provides us to be that are we going to be ready to see Jesus when he comes in the clouds. If not, we'll be racing down Interstate 85 trying to catch up. Paul again stresses the importance of constant, persistent prayer. Ephesians chapter 6. 
Look at verse 18. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. The Greek that we translate into praying always literally means praying in every situation and on every occasion. So you can't be in a place dealing with something that doesn't fall into every situation and every occasion. If you want to follow God's word. Paul gets even more blunt to the point in Colossians chapter 4. Look at verse 2. Colossians chapter 4, verse 2, Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. You and I are to be persistent and consistent in our prayers with thanksgiving. That was principle number four last week, and we won't go over that again. Either we do it God's way, or we don't. Finally, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing. Persistence is often mentioned in Paul's instructions for us on how to pray. Persistence in prayer is rather strongly taught in God's word. Yet the Bible offers not only instruction, but also illustration and example. Jesus in the garden is the most obvious one. Find Matthew chapter 26. Look at verse 36. Matthew 26, verse 36. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little further, fell on his face, and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. You know the rest of the story. With his closest, most intimate disciples, the ones he spent years teaching, training, interacting with, he asks them to pray persistently, consistently, and they go, later, I'm tired right now. In his moment of greatest need, those humans closest to him said, not right now, I need a nap. Three times they needed a nap. Look at verse 40. Then he came to the disciples and found them asleep. Finally, after Jesus prays three times by himself because his disciples are too busy. Luke chapter 22 verse 43 says, God sent assistance to Jesus via an angel. Disciples are hanging around right there. They're well rested at this point. But Jesus, in consistent and persistent prayer with his Father, got that which he needed from the Father. If the Son of God, in his moment of difficulty, participated in persistent prayer, don't you think we need to do that? The creator of the universe 
says, could I have a little help? Just a little. Here's what I want, God, but what you want is going to carry the day. And if I'm going to do that, could I have just a little help? And because of his persistent prayer, God sends an angel. Lift your toes up. You're not going to like the next bullet. You know who George Barna is? He's the Gallup of Christianity. He does all the surveys. Self-reporting, meaning I answer the questionnaire. That's what self-reporting means. Of professed, born-again, they're Christians. (laughs) Evangelical is the word I wanted there. How much time do you spend in prayer? You know what the answer is? How much time per day the self-professed, born-again Christian engages in? One minute. These are the good ones. We're not talking about the heathen. We're talking about us's. One minute. I also have the number of what the pastors self-report. Now, I keep saying self-report because we don't know whether this is accurate. It could be less. This is what pastors, the people who kind of like should be a little closer to the example of what you should be doing, Pastors, they are 500% better than the average Christian. Doesn't that sound impressive? 500% better. They pray five minutes a day. That's self-reporting. Now, just with that fact alone... Think about trying to maintain an intimate, loving friendship with someone and never talking to them. Doesn't work real well. All right, Jesus prayed persistently. How about Paul? Basic knowledge of the New Testament reminds us that Paul had this thing called a thorn in his side. He prays many times for God to remove the thorn. He never did. So just because you're persistent, you ain't getting the lottery numbers for tonight. I'm just saying. God's smarter than that. And for whatever reason, Paul needed the thorn in his side... To be the man God wanted him to be. Thy will be done. Not the short-sighted, illogical, selfish thing that I want. The Apostle Paul shows we all need persistent prayers. Even if God says no. Well, I'm just not going to pray to him if he says no. I know you wouldn't say that. At least out loud. You and I need to understand that there is this principle of persistence in prayer that Scripture says we should do and gives us examples of when people, including our Savior, did it. How about the prayers of the early church? Turn over to the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 14. Acts chapter 1, verse 14 says, These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with women and the Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. The church in Jerusalem continually persistently prayed. 
Turn over to Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Just so you know that verse 42 is about four sermons in one that tells you all the things we should be doing, like growing in the knowledge of the truth, Bible study, communion with Christ and fellow believers, that means worshiping together, not engaging in Facebook worship. There's a whole bunch of reasons, but that's a whole other sermon. Participating in the breaking of bread. That's not only the Lord's Supper, like this afternoon's social event. Engaging in both private and corporate prayer. Turn over to Acts chapter 12. Another illustration of the first century church engaging in persistent prayer. I want you to be in Acts chapter 12, verse 5. Acts chapter 12, verse 5. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. Find verse 12. So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered Praying together. Other New Testament examples, Colossians chapter 4, verse 12, 1 Timothy 5, 5. The early church prayed rather persistently because God told them to. Don't raise your hand. How many people come to the Tuesday night prayer meeting? I know I'm there, so don't have to tell me that answer. I know it's not easy to drive here. Granted, how many people participate in the Monday evening telephone prayer meeting? Don't answer that. I know that number. How are we doing at praying persistently together as God's church? Nicely, I'll just say poorly. Is that bringing a smile to God's face? Or is that bringing a smile to Satan's face? Bible teachings and examples, the importance of persistence is pretty evident. Persistence in a general sense. Keep praying. Keep being engaged in prayer. And be persistent in particular, asking precisely what you think you need. I can't think of a single family in this congregation that doesn't have a member of that family outside the Ark of Safety. Now, just in case you didn't hear it the first time, You have to realize that being persistent doesn't mean God's going to say yes to what you're asking. He will answer your prayer, sometimes by saying no. Well, he didn't give me what I wanted. Yeah, he loves you too much to give you what you want. Persistence in prayer is key to receiving what we desperately need from God. And in his wisdom, he knows what we need. We need grace, we need mercy, and we need strength to be ready when Jesus comes. Through Persistence in prayer, we can keep asking, we can keep seeking, we can keep knocking until God, in His grace, gives us what He knows we need. Then, we will be ready when we see Him coming in the clouds to spend eternity with Him. We don't do it His way. We're not doing it His way. 
Closing hymns number 312, Near the Cross. Let's all stand as we sing. 312. humbly come before you mindful that we have fallen short of your standards 
Lord, we thank you that your word says if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us. Some of us don't pray as much as we should. Should being defined what your word of God says. And so, Lord, I ask that the Holy Spirit touch the hearts of all those here this morning that we might understand the importance of praying consistently and persistently that our relationship with you is strengthened through those prayers and that our growth in character and in perfection comes by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. May we be about your business because if we're not about your business, we're about somebody else's business. Bless us, Lord, that we might be ready to see Jesus when he comes. Is our prayer in his name. Amen.